In week five, there are two main sections that we'll be looking at. Uh, in this particular chapter, it will be preterm labor and birth, and then everything else. A birth before 20 weeks is a miscarriage. It is before the age of viability. A birth between 20 and 37 weeks is considered a preterm birth. The preterm birth of a non-living baby is a stillbirth. Preterm birth is a huge problem in the U.S. A disproportional amount of health care dollars are spent as a result of this, and it is on the rise. Of course, prenatal care seems to have a positive effect on this. That's one reason those of us in women's health want any health care legislation to include provisions for prenatal care for anyone in the U.S., citizen or not, simply because if a preterm baby is born here and goes to an NICU, our health care dollars will pay for that. It would cost much less to provide prenatal care and prevent preterm birth than it would be to pay for NICU care afterward. Your book notes that in 1981, the preterm birth rate was 9.4%, while now it is 12.3%. Why? We don't know, and that's the multi-million dollar question. Take a look at the risk factors for preterm labor. Yet, note the fact in the predicting preterm labor and birth section, that at least 50% of premature births have no identifiable risk factors. Fetal fibronectin and salivary estriol are markers that can help to predict preterm labor, but they are expensive and they're not practical for widespread use. We know that infection can play a role in preterm labor, and that's one reason prenatal care can help prevent it, because infections that can be identified can be treated. Periodontal infections, interestingly enough, may have a role in preterm labor. If steroids are given to women in labor, they can cause the fetal lungs to accelerate in the maturity process, potentially giving the baby the tools he will need to recover from a preterm birth more quickly. If we note that a woman is having preterm labor and can be assured that it will be at least 24 hours and preferably 48, we can give the mother an IM injection of betamethasone or dexamethasone and attempt to give the fetus extra lung maturity, giving a better chance for survival. We do need the 24 to 48 hours for it to take effect. Giving tocolytics to try to stop labor, which may or may not be effective in truly stopping labor, may at least buy us the 24 to 48 hours we need to make the administration of the steroid worth it. If a woman has contractions in a given situation, it is worthwhile to convince her to stop that activity until term, if she's preterm. Sexual intercourse can cause contractions since semen has prostaglandins not sufficient to cause contractions in the vast majority of women, but some women may be more sensitive to it than others. A huge problem with preterm labor is that we have so few effective tools to stop it. We have tocolytic medications, which we will cover a little later, but they only do so much and end up merely postponing it if they are effective at all. They also have many undesirable side effects. We always prescribe bed rest in cases of serious preterm labor, even though we don't have much evidence that it works. Bed rest has many undesirable side effects and is hard for a young woman to implement. But since it might help some, we use it anyway despite the lack of evidence. Make sure you review the deleterious effects of bed rest since these often show up on the standardized tests. Let's talk about tocolytics. None of the tocolytics are especially effective, and all of them have severe enough side effects or toxicity risk to make consideration of their use imperative. My collaborating physicians, uh, when I was practicing as an NP, used terbutaline by mouth and subcutaneous because it can be used on an outpatient basis. There are even now subcutaneous infusion pumps that give continuous small amounts that are finding a niche in inpatient and outpatient settings. For inpatient use, I seem to notice magnesium sulfate infusions as a current trend. We studied mag sulfate for use in preeclampsia in preventing seizures, 
And here's another use for it. Be sure you know the information in the nurse alert in this chapter. Nifedipine is beginning to be utilized more and I think we're going to see it more frequently. After 34 weeks of gestation, we usually don't use any tocolytics. Birth itself in this situation is perhaps less stressful to the health of the mom and baby than using tocolytics. It is also not used in certain maternal conditions in which it could compromise maternal health. Once dilation has reached four centimeters, it is unlikely that we can stop the progress of labor. That doesn't mean we won't try if the situation is serious enough, but when the critical dilation of six centimeters is attained, there is no more point in trying to stop labor.